healing and letting go are possible. So I got into this world really early on. I think uh, it was 2011 when I started realizing that healing was even possible. And this was before wellness was even a giant sort of this giant world that it is today. And um, to me, it was a shock. You know, when I grew up, I thought that if you were sick physically or mentally in some manner, you just had to deal with that for the rest of your life. You couldn't really fix that in any way. And when I started changing my habits, when I started changing what I was eating, when I started reassessing my friend group, and then eventually when I started meditating, the changes were so massive that I was so shocked by them that I wanted to really check in with myself and see that, is this real? And it was real. So that just kind of pushed me into writing where I felt this sort of creative pull to to share the little bit of uh, that I that I know, you know, and it, it was interesting because I know that I don't know everything. I'm not fully healed. I'm not fully wise. I have a long way to go, but hopefully, some of the things that I'm reflecting on could inspire other people to do the serious work as well. And and why? Why does it matter that we heal? Why does it matter? I think it's because it's pretty necessary to live a better life. Like I I think uh, whether you've experienced serious trauma or not you've definitely had hard moments in your life. And those hard moments get accumulated into the mind. They literally, you know, the times when you react very intensely with anger, with sadness, with whatever emotion it is, that reaction gets accumulated in your mind and predisposes you to feeling that same thing again. And oftentimes we don't quite realize that we're sort of like trapped in this tight little bubble by our past and we're thinking the same things saying the same things, making the same actions, and it keeps us in a loop. But if you start healing, you can basically get access to your freedom. So so thinking about what you said there about your own healing journey where you couldn't believe the results were real mm-hmm. and true. Mm-hmm. What did you heal from? I think a lot of it was anxiety and stress and um, this sort of scarcity mindset. So I was born in Ecuador in the city called Guayaquil. I came to the United States when I was about four years old with my parents. When we got to the United States, it was incredibly difficult. Like we were stuck in the classic American poverty trap. Uh, My mom, she worked cleaning houses. My dad, he worked um, at a supermarket. So there was no upward mobility for us. Um, They didn't know English. You know, we were, we were, we went through a really difficult time. So as I was growing up, I didn't notice how that was affecting me until I got to college where, you know, I had so much anxiety and stress about, you know, I would see my parents fight constantly about how they were going to pay the rent, how they were going to get more groceries. I experienced multiple times where I was, you know, eight year old child and I'm so hungry because there wasn't enough food in the fridge. And this all got accumulated over time and never really properly processed. You know, like I didn't have access to a therapist back then, no meditating back then. It was sort of just, um, you know, coping mechanisms. And when I got to university, I hit this breaking point where I didn't want to admit to myself that I didn't feel good. I was constantly trying to cope myself in pleasure by drinking as much as possible, smoking as much as possible, um, always with friends, never alone. And I ended up just like building all these bad habits where I was partying constantly, doing tons of drugs, and um, eventually hit that breaking point in the summer of 2011 where I almost lost my life. Um, I talked to a doctor afterwards and described to them what happened, and they were like, oh yeah, it sounds like a mild heart attack, where I had just taken way too many drugs one night, was on the floor crying, basically, you know, praying, begging for my life, um, because I didn't didn't want to go out like that. And going through that experience, and then basically taking a different route into the life that I have now, I think um, I'm really grateful that I had that strength and I want other people to know that they have that strength too. I was just thinking then how many, how many of us really know how we're feeling? Like how many of us really know how we ourselves are feeling truly? Like when was the last time, I think for most people listening to this, have you really sat there on the end of your bed or wherever and asked yourself how you're actually feeling, all things considered, what's out of balance? It's rare, but I think it's becoming more popular. I'm pretty inspired by what's happening now. I've um, I've been watching this whole 
wellness world brew and grow and develop. And obviously it's ha it has its downs. It has a lot of consumerism around it, but there are a lot of positives. And there are just millions and millions of people who are seeing therapists now. There's millions and millions of people who are meditating. And there are millions and millions more journaling, reflecting, building self-awareness, building language around these, you know, newer ideas. Um, I mean, actually old ideas, but that have, you know, come back around. Um, is that also slightly concerning? What do you mean? Because it, it's, it's a sign that there is a increasing demand potentially for, <laughs> you know what I mean? If it's, if, if there's more fire extinguishers being sold. <laughs> right, 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 right. Like, there's more fires. Oh, it's totally concerning. <laughs> I'm, I think, um, it's concerning, but I think to me it gives it gives us gives me hope, honestly, because of course the world is incredibly challenging. You know, the advent of technology, especially with social media, the increases in loneliness, like we know, we know, like the cause and effect are very clear, right? But these tools have been around for like, you know, the Western tools of therapy, what, a hundred, hundred and fifty years? the Eastern tools of different forms of meditation, indigenous healing practices, these things have been around for millennia. And now that the world is globalized, people in major cities especially have access to them. Like you can type in like, what can, what, what can I do to deal with my anxiety? And you have like, you know, things from, from psychiatrists, like, you know, you can go to your like local meditation center. There are tons of things that you can do now. And what you just have to do is find something that meets you where you're at. So you do see these two things rise together where the demand for your attention is through the roof now from the media, from tech, from everything that's happening around you, family and friends. But at the same time, here are a bunch of tools for you to get your mind right so that you can not be overwhelmed by these demands. I am certainly guilty of using screens and other means to distract myself from how I'm feeling. In fact, you know, when I'm feeling tired or, you know, bothered in some way or a little bit agitated and whatever way it might be, my way of dealing with that is to pick up a screen. Yeah. I was going to be honest. Pick up a screen and either watch something on YouTube, distract myself from the feeling, maybe watch some football mm -hmm. um, or something else, you know, something else that's probably not so good for me. Um, and I think that, you know, scrolling on my phone, for example, I think that represents the, the majority of people. We use distraction as a way to avoid confronting how we're feeling because confronting how we're feeling is, can be uncomfortable. Absolutely. I mean, confronting how you're feeling for a lot of us, that's the gateway to growth, right? So if you're going to be there and stand with your emotions, you either see so much that you want to keep running or you're like, okay, I'm going to accept this challenge and let's see how I should grow next. So it is quite difficult. Is it called Vipinsana? Vipinsana? Vipassana. 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 There's a bunch of ways to say it. What is yeah. that? It's a meditation uh, that's been around, uh, that originated from the Buddhist teaching. So 2,600 years where you basically uh, do your best to see reality as it really is. And it's very different from how we normally see reality, right? You and I are hanging out. We're talking. We're having this conversation. It feels like it's two individuals speaking, but let's ask ourselves what's happening at the ultimate level where, well, Diego and Steven were basically just these like bundles of atoms that are changing so incredibly rapidly, trillions of times. And at the same time, it's just mental and physical phenomena interlocking at incredibly high speeds that makes the illusion that we're here. Um, but in reality, are we real? No, not really. Why is that an important or valuable exercise? It's quite valuable. I think the sense of self, um, when it becomes overgrown, when it, when it becomes highly traumatized, um, it creates a barrier to happiness. So what I found through Vipassana meditation was that as I was observing the truth of impermanence, literally within the framework of the body, you know, when you start learning that everything that arises ultimately passes away and you start understanding that change is it exists within the fabric of every single thing in this universe, you start loosening up your identity. It's not as rigid as it was before. It's not like Diego always reads science fiction and he always loves blueberries. Actually, it's not true. Sometimes I love watermelon. Sometimes I love, you know, like reading fiction. Some, you know, so it allows this 
uh, understanding of change to help you loosen up and really evolve. Um, and I uh, have found that quite beneficial to my personal joy and happiness and definitely in my relationships because if you embrace change, you're not going to be as attached. It's not going to be like, I want you to do this this way all the time. In fact, you're going to understand, oh, no, different conditions create different situations. So, yes, I can have goals, but if they don't come about, I'm not going to be crying on the floor. I'm just going to try again. How do you think our earliest experiences impact the relationship we have with change? Because change, it's funny because there's this almost duality of being a human where we seem to like things staying the same. There's a certain totally. security and comfort. Yeah. Even the idea of self-identity, that's yeah. almost like a resistance to change. It allows me to be understood. If I if I give you my totally. bio, my business card, it will say CEO of marketing company. Mm -hmm. Then you get mm -hmm. me. You know where I fit. I feel like I'm, I fit somewhere and there's, there's a tribe somewhere. But at the same time, the human experience yearns for progress. Totally. And we're not trying to have people get rid of their identities, right? What we're trying to do is create um, a sense of flexibility within that identity where we don't often see that human beings, we tend to side on the extreme of the apparent reality. That's what I was mentioning before. Like, I am here, you are there, we're speaking to each other, that's apparently happening. But we totally forget the ultimate reality. We totally forget that everything is constantly changing. Even this hard table, it's changing so fast, so fast that you can't even witness it. You can't even see it unless you profoundly calm down the mind and start developing your awareness, your equanimity, and you do this within the framework of the body. Because when you understand what's happening within the body, you actually understand universal law. You understand what's happening you know, throughout the universe and missing that undercurrent of change, missing that understanding that your ego is not this permanent thing, it helps you tremendously so that you're not as attached as you're moving through the world because we're constantly trying to control everything, control ourselves, control the people around us, control whatever situation we can get our hands on. And what happens when you're just trying to constantly control things? Misery, so much misery, so much struggle, so much mental tension. And I think that's why embracing change, like your original question, you know, what is our relationship with change? It's a combative one. It's a, it's a situation where, you know, we grow up as children and we, you know, all we're focusing on is building our identity, right? When you're becoming little, you're learning the culture, you're sort of taking it all in and you develop your sense of self. But when you become older, you know, when you're grounded and you have a, you know, a good sense of identity, you also need to develop an understanding of what's ultimately happening around here. And I think when you get a real taste of ultimate truth, it helps you tremendously because I, I think if if I didn't have, if I didn't switch around my relationship with change, um, like I would have no access to peace. It's interesting because you're, you're totally right. When I was younger, I grew up hoovering in information that allowed me to survive. And I built my identity around the character that was required to survive in that context. Right. Not the character that would make me happiest in my life or for most fulfilled or best in relationships. So what was formed by the age of 18 was this like insecure, shame ridden kid who would run from relationships because he thought those were prison. Mm -hmm. um, and that stood in the way of all of my, so many of my goals. It certainly stood in the way of me being really happy, but it also stood in the way of me finding romantic love. Right. And it was unpacking that identity and becoming aware of it, its existence, mm -hmm. and then unpacking it and trying to unlearn it that allowed me to pursue the things that now make me fulfilled yeah. and happy. I'm still not there yet. <laughs> I haven't really met anybody that is. Um, but I find that really interesting that like we build that identity around survival. And then as an adult, at some point, we need to like review it. You hit it on the dot. So I think when we, it makes sense evolutionarily, like you, evolution wants you to be able to survive. It mm -hmm. does not care about your happiness. It does not care about your sense of thriving. But as you come to fruition and you come into being and you're like, you're here, you have your sense of identity, you realize that there's so much misery wrapped in the sense of self, wrapped in, wrapped in your attachments. And to be able to really thrive and to be happy, it requires letting go. I mean, how much stress have you caused yourself, right? There's like, we have to ask ourselves this. Like, of course, you know, sometimes people get offended by this question, but you have to realize that uh, there have definitely been people in your life who've caused you harm, people who've done terrible things, but it's you and yourself in that mind of yours. 
right? It's it's just you, and I, and we don't quite understand how many times we replay the past over and over, and then those same feelings of tension come up again and again, and we have no way to really process that unless we try to actively find some sort of tool that will help us let go. Uh, and I think it's really important to just, you know, you got to see what you're doing to yourself. How? Self-awareness, time alone, reflecting, have a good teacher, you know, have someone who can point things out to you that you couldn't see before. I think that's ultimately what a lot of therapists are doing is like, have you asked yourself this? Have you been honest about this? And similar with meditation, and it's it's you developing a um, you know a sense of an ability to observe instead of just judgment. Because constantly, when I'm looking out in the world, I'm just evaluating things, giving you this evaluation according to the memory that I have, this record inside of my mind. But instead of constantly just evaluating things, why can't I just observe? Why does it have to be plus or minus? Let me just watch what's happening right now. We're all in cycles, aren't we? Every fa all, most facets of my life, I think pretty much every facet of my life is in some kind of cycle. Now, some of those cycles are positive. Mm -hmm. So me working out and going to the gym, that seems to be a positive cycle that I've managed to build. Some people might call that a habit. And then I do have other cycles in my life where I go, that happened, I reacted like that. That was not the, re the reaction that would bring me closer to my goals and fulfillment. Um, I'll try not to do that again. And then the thing happens and I, that kind of cycle repeats yeah. itself. And in so many, you know, I think about myself, I think about my friends, I think about, you know, even some of my my close sort of mentors. Um, I observe those cycles in their life that they're trying to break out of, but they just, they just seem so stubborn. Right. I've lived through so many of those stubborn cycles where for years and years and years, I've known it's a problem. Mm -hmm. I've not known how to get out of it. Mm. What advice would you give me or someone else in, in a situation where we, we know we're in a cycle, whether it's relationships or work or how we're responding to things? And we feel stuck in that cycle. Yeah, I think that's that's what a lot of us are going through is that um, the past is constantly in a loop, right? A mm -hmm. lot of, like, we are very largely formed by those first few years of life. You know, a lot of uh, psychologists say uh, to you about the age of seven, I would say it's more. It's like it's um, every time that you react, it gets accumulated. So those moments of heartbreak, like your first love, your first loss, like, all of these things that have um, really formed your sense of self, they are impacting the way that you're perceiving and the way that you're reacting to the world. And I think for a lot of us, we probably one of the best tools that we don't access is just the ability to slow down, is just slowing down, literally just pumping the brakes. And what you just talked about, what you just described, being able to spend time observing okay, this is what I'm feeling. This is how I want to react. You know, I have this, because initially our initial reaction is pretty rough. Mm -hmm. It's like the most defensive one, the most survival oriented one. But it's like, okay, that that's actually going to make a bigger mess of things. What can I do differently? Like, what can I do to change this play that's happening around me so that I can put a different input and hopefully get a different output? And I think when we slow down, we see that. And that's one of the gifts that I personally got from meditating was, I didn't have that ability ability before. Like the reaction was lightning fast. You know, someone said something about me I didn't like immediately, like hate. Like I would be so upset, so like, you know, wanting to control their view of me. And now it's like, let me slow down. Let me see how I would have dealt with this before. What's like the actually the most skillful thing that I can do in this moment to like, you know, to just stay in value with myself and at the same time just like maneuver out of this like is this even worth my time you do know do you need to know where that reaction's coming from do you need to know the root cause no no i think a lot of people get stuck in like examining the past and like peeling the like okay like my mom said this one thing to me one time and then my dad did this other thing like it's totally valuable to understand your past but healing happens in the present moment like those feelings like if you want to deal with your past you need to be able to create space for the feelings that are coming up right now because often those feelings that are coming up right now are just echoes of the past. You don't need to know a narrative, like you don't need to give a narrative to every single feeling. You know, you literally just have to be able to hold space for them. And when you do hold space for them, a lot of the unbinding happens so that you're not as knotted up inside. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor. 
become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.